Steve Ware, welcome to the Entrepreneur Next Door. Um, it's always a pleasure for me to say you're not quite next door. Uh, you're in England, in I'm going to go for memory, Portsmouth. Correct. Right. Yeah, uh, last time we spoke, you said that you are a loyal fan of the Portsmouth local football team, or as we call it, U.S. soccer. But then I asked you, okay, nobody's listening. Who are you really <laughs> a fan of in England? You said, I think you said Arsenal, but, yeah. but the story of how you became an Arsenal fan, I thought was hilarious. Cause so could you repeat that? Of course. Yeah. So I, uh, I was a little kid. It was about this time of year, actually. It's a couple of weeks. In a couple of weeks time, we have bonfire night here, which is pretty big celebration, Guy Fawkes night. And we set fireworks off and blah, blah, blah. And I was at one when I was a kid, I must've been under 10. And they do a big display, there's a fireworks and it's all, it's all pretty muddy by that time of year, right? So I was running around as a kid and I found a hat in the mud and I said to mum and dad, I'm going to take this home. I want, I want this hat. And they're like, yeah, I've taken that grubby secondhand hat home. Anyway, I insisted so much that I took it home. My mum put it in the washing machine. It came out the washing machine and on the top, there was an Arsenal crest, Arsenal Football Club crest. And I said, that's my team then. That's going to be my team. So um, the one test of loyalty as to who I really support was when Portsmouth were in the top division. And because it was Portsmouth v Arsenal. And then my heart was so in Portsmouth. So, so when push comes to shove, Zev, it's Portsmouth. Yeah. But, you know, if I keep an eye on the top teams, the Premier League teams, then, uh, then I'm rooting for the Arsenal, yeah. Well, it's I, I think it's a fascinating story, particularly for diehard football fans. Well, how'd you pick that team? Well, I found a hat in it. Somewhere, right? It's yeah, it's good. Anyway. So, yeah. So, all right. So, let's jump into our entrepreneurial podcast. And um, uh, my my short intro, just to kind of set us up, is that uh, as somebody who's been in the corporate world for thirty years and a business coach for twelve, uh, I've come across uh, many many different types of companies and ownership. And for me, after all these years of experience and exposure, um, I don't really care about your product or service. I mean, I do care, but I think that, uh, at least from my perspective, the, the one thing that turns average companies to exceptional companies, regardless of what tech they have or what service they have, always comes back to the people that work there kind of keep it simplified, right? Mm -hmm. It's the corporate, it's it's not just the people, but it's the corporate culture that allows people to grow personally, professionally, that gives them a reason to want to get up and go to work every day, uh, do the best work they can and make a difference. Yeah. So with, with that as an intro, um, and, and we'll talk about your universe, which is how do you take, how do you make a difference inside a business that directly affects the employees? And even though, and, and, you know, you'll cover it, you spend, I guess you spent your entire life with IBM, right? 28 years, pretty yeah. much for a young bloke like you, that's, that's a lifelong career. Yeah. Um, but what you do doesn't necessarily impact only enterprise level companies. It could work on a, five people operation or 5,000, it doesn't matter. It all comes back to the human element inside yeah. the company. Excellent. So you go to university, you get a, a bachelor's degree in computer science. Um, is that what you wanted to be when you grew up? Was that your, I want to be a, a geek? No. Do you know what? I never, I never owned a laptop my entire life at IBM. I bought my first laptop three years ago when I lost my job and, and I decided to set up my company. So I was never, I, I fell into IBM by accident. I was in the careers office. It was a rainy day at, at school. I didn't know what I wanted to do next. I was coming up to 18, so I had to decide to go to university. Which university, what am I going to study? I was studying three topics at A-level. One was uh, computer science, because I kind of quite liked it. Um, and the other two were languages, French and German. 
Um, but so I was in the careers office. There's Paul and Lorraine. We're all kind of stuck inside. And there's a, there's a bit of paper there. It's from IBM to our careers office. And it says, I can almost remember the exact words. It says, if you have an aptitude for or an interest in computing, we're running uh, like a hand-picked scholarship team uh, uh, course. So we're going to take 20 or less people from all around the country and we're going to put them through our program where you go to university and study for your degree. And at the same time, you work for us as a full-time employee. So you don't have the regular student life. You don't have the long holidays. You don't have the like five hours of lectures a week and plenty of time to sit in a union bar and get drunk. Uh, you've got to spend your time working at IBM. And when you're not at IBM, you'll go to the university and have your compressed lectures there. The thing that sold it for me was they said, we're going to pay you. Uh, back then, 1992, it was the princely sum of £7,440 per annum, my starting salary. But man, I was going to leave university with no debt. With three years from you know, one of the world's biggest companies, very well-respected company, especially in the 90s. And I thought, I may as well apply. May as well apply. And I applied. I got on great with the interviewer and um, got offered the course. So I just kind of, without thinking too much about it, I just kind of fell into it, Zev. Mm. And then, you know, how the hell did I end up there for 28 years? If that's your next question, I don't know. I just kind of... I just kind of got comfy. I was good at my job. I did lots of different technical roles, loved helping people, loved fixing their problems, always loved that. But every now and then I'd get this kind of, I kind of look around me and go, I'm in the wrong game here. I'm a fish out of water here. I'm not feeling it. There's no passion here. There's no passion for what I do. I love helping people. That was the strongest bit about I loved about my job. The technology I didn't care too much about. You know, I'd hear people at work saying things like, oh, I've got this latest graphics card and I'm building this computer and we've got this new processor and we've got this and this and everyone's getting really excited about it and I used to think I don't care about any of that stuff so am I, am I, am I in the wrong game am I in the wrong job so I fell into it completely accidentally um, I also fell out of IBM kind of completely accidentally and into my next now <laughs> full time job here kind of accidentally so um, my life's been one big accident up to this point <laughs> So, well, the, you call this, you call it the accidental IBM or it's the title of your next book, but, um, it, it's interesting because, uh, the, this type of a, a career opportunity, at least my opinion, does not exist anymore. It really hasn't existed since the rise of the, the internet early 2000. I mean, I mean, in the U S everybody dreamed about working for big companies. Mm -hmm. So you either work for big companies or you work for the government because that's where you have you know, a nice retirement plan and benefits. Yeah. Big companies was the dream job because, you know, the big company is going to allow you to move to another big company or I'll get a later on career. Uh, that doesn't, there's no such thing anymore working for yeah. big companies. When you think about the big companies today, well, obviously they still exist, but it, it's the Google, the Facebook, the Amazon uh, on the tech side. I mean, IBM still around for sure. But the economy, at least here, and I'm, UK is, is pretty much mirror country to us, I think. Uh, the economy is driven by small business. It's not the, the big, the career of I'm going to spend next 35 years with a company, get a gold watch, retire happily into somewhere. Just doesn't work. I think it started with the, uh, the dot-com boom yeah. where we're switching jobs um, every few years which when I was growing up would be a huge black mark next to your name. Yeah. Uh, now, if you switch jobs every two to three years, it's okay. It's, it's acceptable. So what was, what was your main job at IBM? So I was always technical jobs, always kind of supporting systems, problem solving. My main job before I left was really being heavily involved in the shift from uh, laptop to mobile devices. So this big shift that we had in the last 10 years of being able to work on mobiles, started off with our emails. You know, now we can do big parts of our day jobs on tablets and phones, have our email securely on the go. Um, yeah, the switch to mobile was my big, probably the last big project I did before I left. And I think it just, it just occurred to me that in the IBM versus Apple, Maybe it's the Microsoft versus Apple because IBM, IBM never never really ran their own operating system, right? They were still using 
um, the Microsoft system. So yeah. in, in the yeah. in, a, in the old IBM Microsoft versus Apple, um, I think on the PC side, IBM came. I, I think they came late into the game, right? Because they were mostly a mainframe mini type companies. But as PCs started to take over, I think thanks to Apple, uh, yeah. it, cha- it changed the landscape for IBM, right? Yeah, and then IBM got out of that business. I think they sold their PC business to, to a company called Lenovo. Correct. That's right. I mean, my first IBM ThinkPad, which I love, the laptop, hmm. was great. And then it was it was one of the most reliable things that I've ever traveled with. Hmm. Um, so, so let's jump into... At some point with inside your career at IBM, you have this, I don't know if it was epiphany, but you, you identify an unmet need within the corporate environment that has to do with people's, I'll call this mental state. Yeah. Right. Um, how did that come about? Yeah, so let's rewind a bit. So I, I never set out to help anybody. It's going to sound really selfish, but it's the truth. Um, other than myself, when it came to mental health. Um, I grew up very much thinking, I don't know what I thought. I, I, I kind of didn't pay too much attention to my mental health. I was really good physically. I'd go to the gym and you know I wouldn't drink too much alcohol and I've never smoked and this kind of stuff. But my mental health, I never really, I thought that would kind of just care, take care of itself. But I had a bit of a rude awakening after 20 years at IBM where I just kind of burned out. And I went from having normal anxiety levels to anxiety levels that were just high all the time. And that made me feel like I was existing rather than living. It made me feel, it made my sleep awful. I couldn't switch off. I had no way of quieting my mind. My mind was just, it went crazy when it wanted to go crazy. The thoughts would just come and, be, and just sweep me away. And it was like a like a torrent. It was just kind of so strong. Um, so I was seeking something for myself, Zerv. And I wanted to feel, God, I just wanted to feel peaceful again. I just wanted to feel calm for five seconds. I wanted to feel like... You know, when you're a kid and you go out and you just play or you just lie in a field and look up and climb a tree or just do something so simple and life seems simple and life doesn't seem heavy and your mind doesn't drive you crazy all the time. I wanted to feel that again. I was desperate for that. So so I wanted to ask you because the, you're describing something that that we all go through. Every, every single one of my listeners or podcast subscribers – uh, YouTube subscribers, everybody feels exactly what you described because we live in this crazy roller coaster world that things are constantly coming at us. There's external pressures and internal pressures, whether it's family, whether it's career, whatever the story is. The yeah. news clearly, if you watch the news, doesn't help because it's mostly negative, depressing stuff. Yeah. Um, you described it beautifully, and then you said, "I, I kind of wanted to go back to a point where I." that I felt happy or I felt calm is, is that, can you look back and say there was a benchmark in my life that I can relate to and that's where I want to go to? Yeah. I mean, if I, if I think about the times in my life where I felt very calm, very peaceful, probably during my childhood, although looking back, I was probably still quite an anxious kid. You know, if I, if I look on it in hindsight, um, I was the anxious kid that was kind of on the surface level, portraying this sense of being very calm. I've got this. I excelled at a lot of things. I was very good at most things. I was very good at sport. My mum and dad sent me dancing when I was a kid. I danced professionally when I was like 11 years old. They flew me to Japan for a, for a professional assignment. I did all these things as a kid where the world was telling me, um, you're really good at this. You're perfect at this. You can't show any imperfection and you can't show any flaws. And other people are going to ask you for advice and help. And you need to be the one that can give that. You can't be the, in quotes, weak one that can't ever handle anything. So I kind of developed this way of living where on the surface it was very successful. Um, 
but underneath that, there was a more insecurity than most people would know and way more anxiety than anyone would ever know. And when you combine that with this position that I put myself in, where you don't ask for help, you're the tough guy, you're the macho guy, you work for this big corporate, you know, the kick-ass take names, then, then it makes you even less willing or able to ask for help and get help. So I felt pretty squeezed when I, when I, you know, when I was feeling these feelings of high anxiety and bad sleep and, you know, depression, I thought I'd probably use that word. I was very sad about the whole situation. Um, I didn't really know what to do is it, but I knew I didn't really want, um, medication, but I didn't know how else to help myself. Um, I say that there was 1% of me that thought that just would float the idea. There's this thing called meditation and there's this thing called mindfulness. I don't know what the hell it was, but I know it was, I knew it was hundreds, thousands of years old. And I knew, you know, there was some pretty good testimonials out there from some pretty reliable sources. But when someone suggested to me at IBM, Hey, you look, you're stressed. You're not sick. Why don't you try mindfulness? I, and I swore at them. And I said, I'll tell you exactly where you can put your, your mindfulness book and all your apps and your phone. Um, I'm not trying. So, so you know, it's interesting, Steve, because, um, I mean, we, we could say that as men, because it's you and me, men are not really good at expressing emotions. No. Um, women tend to be more emotional, but that's, that's not really relevant to the conversation. What's relevant is that when you work in any business environment, doesn't matter, regardless of your seniority level, when you work in a company where pretty much all eyes are on you, um, asking for help or displaying any sort of a quote unquote weakness, mm. um, and I, I still believe it's still to this day is true. It's, a, it's kind of like held against you, right? Mm. Uh, you expect it to be resilient and tough and have grit and oh ah, he's upset because something didn't work out yeah um there's too much pressures on you when you're internally like that and yeah. then the other piece is leading into mindfulness and meditation um i don't think it's it's as prevalent today as maybe years ago but we used to look at people who meditate and are, I don't know what we call them, sp more spiritual as, you know, these are like the, the weirdos. Oh, they're, they're sitting cross-legged on the yeah. beach with, you know, doing one of these things in their hands. And, yeah. Right? It, it's, it's become much more acceptable yeah. or accepted. Yeah. But you said, just like me, I know a lot of people, there's somebody that, that, uh, that I really, really like a lot and, he told me a couple of weeks ago, the thing that made a difference in his life was meditation, right? And I don't do it. I really want to do it. I want to, I do want to try it, mm. but I'm, I, I hear it. I know that scientifically, and you, you confirm this, that it does work, mm. but I'm kind of like trying to bridge the gap between, I can't display any sort of weakness when I'm an employee or a leader or manager or an owner. Mm. Uh, because that shows, you know, not a, a, a solid mental state that you need to be quote unquote successful. Mm. And yet at the same time, oh, you know, what do you do today? Oh, I get up and I meditate. Then I, you know, it's like, it's more acceptable, but it's still not there. So you, you dove into this because you wanted to help yourself first. Totally. hundred percent. And, and then what happened? And so I hid it from everybody, right? I wasn't, I wasn't bursting through the doors of all the bars in Portsmouth saying to people, guys, we got to meditate and who's up for this and told nobody, didn't tell my friends, didn't tell anyone, didn't tell my colleagues, uh, tried it, tried it, even though I had, I mean, let me throw this in. I was very reluctant to try it, Zev, very reluctant to try it, right? I had all these different ideas. I had this side of my brain that's saying it's garbage, it's navel gazing, it's the weirdos on the beach to take your words, right? And I had all this other stuff that said, yeah, but you, maybe it is the real thing. And, and if you get too good at it, well, then IBM's going to you know, get rid of you because you don't want, you, you're going to be this guy that just, this passive blob that just kind of sits there and, Oh, don't give Steve any work because he's just Zen, you know, he doesn't do anything anymore. So mm -hmm. in that, isn't that amazing? That's just an amazing observation for me. 
something about which I know nothing doesn't stop my own thinking mind coming up from coming up with two hugely different opinions about that same thing about which it knows nothing it's telling me not to do it because I'll get too good at it and it, and that will be a bad thing it's telling me not to do it because it doesn't exist it's rubbish it's garbage it's bs it's navel gazing so which is it like i mean my mind is in them to start with, just notice if people take one thing from this, forget the meditation, forget the mindfulness on trying to make anyone do anything. Just notice how contradictory your mind is. Notice how your mind isn't worth believing a lot of the time. Try and question your thoughts sometimes. Try and observe this narrative in your head. Try and observe this voice that's incessant. Just try and be the observer of that. If, if that's the only thing you do in your life, shift from being the thoughts to being able to observe the thoughts and have the tiniest gap between them, that space in which you can choose to respond or react, that's huge. That will change your life in itself. I mean, meditation is a beautiful way to nurture that, to strengthen that and to, and to you know, that much more a, a way of living. But so, yeah, I tried it. I, I tried it just for a little bit on my own and it changed my life in a tiny way, Zev, right? So there's no, you know, this would be a great podcast if I could say, Zev, do you know what? I did 10 minutes for 10 days and my life's been unicorns and rainbows ever since. I skip out of bed every morning. Nothing bad ever happens. I'm a multi-millionaire. Um, you know, that wasn't the reality of it. The reality is much more in the same way that if somebody unfit tried exercising, right? You may just, maybe you get to a flight, top of the flight of stairs and go, maybe I'm not quite so out of breath. Maybe you feel like you've got a little bit more energy. Maybe you sleep a tiny bit better. There were these tiny little things that started to pervade my life that started to creep in. And that's what piqued my interest. That's what made the hands on the back of my neck stand up. And I thought, wow, is there something in this? Am I kidding myself? Is there something in it? I don't know. So I started reading the science. I wanted to see what that said. I started learning from the greatest authors, the greatest teachers in the world. I started downloading all the apps. I started consuming this, like I like just an insatiable desire to learn more about this thing. Because I thought, have I just found water in a drought here? This is potentially mm -hmm. the biggest thing thing in the world still didn't still wasn't thinking i need to teach my colleagues this i need to take this out into the world i need to take this into business where it's most needed none of that i was, I was just thinking can i help myself but it got a bit interesting when people at work came to me after a little while and said steve what are you doing because you have changed you are calmer you are more centered you are less reactive and i told them mm -hmm. can you teach us we're as stressed as you are so I think that that I'm a marketing guy, always was. And to me, when I look at the world in terms of marketing, the, there's three types of people in the marketing realm. There are those that understand marketing, are doing it successfully, and it works. Mm -hmm. on, the, on the other extreme, there are those that never tried marketing and don't care about it. They go about their life or their business, in this case, they still manage to have a business. They still have referrals, and they they don't believe in marketing. They don't. Then there are the people in the middle that said, "Well, I tried it. It doesn't work." <laughs> right. So the ones that do it and it works for them, the ones that never did anything, and the one in the middle, the skeptic that said, "Ah, oh, yeah, I know about marketing. I tried it, but honestly, it doesn't work." Whatever. I think meditation, mindfulness is probably the same thing. There are those like you who are impacted by it, and then you go preach the gospel. Then there are those who never tried it, and there are those like me who dabbled in it because the Apple Watch has a, I think it's the calm one that reminds you to stop and meditate. And I'm really super disciplined, but I've never been disciplined enough to just go for it. Right. So before you go into the, the how did it impact you, um, I, I like science. I like data. What does the science say about meditation? I mean, so the science has exploded in the last 10 years. There are more studies. And these, are, you know, there's some great stuff out there. It's a Google search away. Um, and it's good stuff now. It's double blind, peer reviewed, you know, empirical studies from very well respected places like Harvard and Oxford and, and all these other great places around the world. I mean, what does mindfulness, what does this tell us? It's incredible what it tells us. I mean, there's there's a book, for example, one of the ones I use just for fun sometimes is that meditators, regular meditators physically age 
more slowly. So there's something called telomeres or telomeres on the end of our DNA, and they shorten rest less rapidly among those people that meditate frequently. I can let me give you some when when we get into the science, and I'm no neuroscientist by the way, because I'm this is kind of kindergarten overview stuff. But one of the ones I like to, to, to say to people, probably one of the biggest discoveries is something called neuroplasticity, which I think has been yeah. discovered in the last 10 years. And if anybody doesn't know what that is, here's a real simple um, example. So they took taxi drivers in London. This is a while ago. They took taxi drivers in London and they took bus drivers in London and they measured their brains. Now, the taxi drivers in London, I'm talking about the people that are in the proper London black cabs. And to get one of those back in the day, I don't know if it's still the case now, that to pass a yeah. test called the knowledge. I don't know if you guys that get that. It's in the US. And the knowledge. Uh, uh, by, the, uh, by the way, I, do, I have to interrupt you because people don't know this. And I listened to a podcast with a, one of those drivers and it blew my mind because I didn't realize. Oh, really? how hard they work, oh, huge. you know, the, the, you know huge. The, and they have, they literally have to memorize. It's only, I think a quarter of a mile in, in London proper, but there are 6,000 roads. They have to literally memorize yeah. every single road, but not just that, but every potential route to get there. And yep. then they get tested yes. and, and the person giving them the test it doesn't tell them, oh, take me to whatever, Edinburgh Street, I'm making stuff up. But, he, he, I mean, the guy said on his test, the tester said to him, there is this play at this theater mm. in this corner. There, the construction on three streets. How would you get there or something? I mean, it is. And yeah. that's why they said that, that somebody said that, you know, you literally, it's a lifelong license to get the black car yeah, you know the taxi cab license because you have to pass it, and it takes years to get there. Yeah, and that's why if somebody reports one of these drivers that they scammed them or took a long, I mean, they their livelihood is gone. So I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I thought that was to me. I yeah, just so, reminded me. The that, go ahead. Well, so so awesome. cab drivers, bus drivers. Okay, the cab drivers they pass. They call that the knowledge that test that they have to pass the knowledge. Yeah, and you're right. They need to because it's got to mimic real life, right? If I get on a taxi in, in Park Lane and say, uh, I don't know, I want to go to the theater. Take me to the nearest theater. You got to know where the nearest theater is. You can't just get Google yeah. out and start typing stuff. In. So <clears throat> what they found is obviously the bus drivers, pretty much the same route every day. They're not taking requests. Um, so a very different job. And they, when they compared the men and women who drive the taxis versus the men and women who drive the buses, they found that the men and women in the taxis, the hippocampus, which is a part of the brain associated with spatial mapping, which is this part of our brain you know, that, that is involved in passing the knowledge, if you want to say that, they found that it had literally grown in these people. And it was way, way more active than that of an average person or that of a bus driver, which fell into the kind of average person. And this is a huge discovery, right? This was, even though it seems like such an obvious thing to say, Zev, right? Because if I said to you, hey, Zev, if I, if I go to my local gym and I, and I put a 15 kilo weight in here and I go like this, guess what? This muscle gets bigger and stronger. And you go, yeah. But if I say to you, hey, Zev, if I use my brain to do this, if I practice this regularly, here's what happens to my brain. You know, this, this area comes online more. This area doesn't come online so much. This part of the brain, if I do it enough, could actually change shape and size over time. You know, in the old days, you'd say, no, you're crazy, of course you're not. You can't change your, your brain. Your brain's just, just this lump of kind of fat in your head that just doesn't. So this is a huge discovery um, and hugely applicable to mindfulness, right? Because if we're talking about the other bit of science I like is a guy called Mathieu Ricard. He's a French um, academic term Buddhist monk. And this guy is like the Olympic athlete of meditation, right? So he's done tens of thousands of hours. He's top of his game. A guy called Richard Davidson took him to the University of Wisconsin, put 256 centers on his head, and he said, meditate. I want to measure what your brain's doing. And I'm going to compare it to an average brain. And when they did this, um, I was listening to a podcast, Richard Davidson talking about this, and he started laughing. He said, we're measuring this guy's brain. And the results we're getting are so off the chart here that we thought we'd calibrated the machine wrongly. And we had to apologize to him and take it all apart and put it all back together. And we said, we're so sorry. We've got our baselines wrong here. And they put it back and they got the same results. So the press picked this up. Quick Google will show you that they call this guy the happiest man in the world. 
Mathieu Ricard is the happiest man in the world. Scientifically, he's the happiest man. I don't like the word happy, but that's what they that's what they use because that's what sells papers. Um, and what they found was that his left prefrontal cortex, um, which is kind of loosely speaking, is associated with feeling at ease, feeling calm, feeling good. That was way, way, way more active um, compared to his right prefrontal cortex, which is associated with being fearful and shrinking in and anxious and scared. And oh, what's going on? I don't like this. So when they scan these people's brains, regular meditators' brains and bodies, right? You can have, you can put someone in a functional MRI scanner. You can check their heart rate variability, even something as basic as heart rate. Right? I've had people on my course, managers at IBM and in other companies. That have said to me, once we get into maybe three, four weeks of it, they're saying to me, you know, one guy came in, he was checking his wrist, and he was he said, he said, Steve, my heart rate's 10 beats lower since I started doing this stuff. I had one guy who was, after eight weeks of training with me, for the first time in a decade, his blood pressure went from he had prehypertension for 10 years, it came back to normal for the first time in their day. So so when, when you talk about somebody's uh, heart rate, usually uh, really fit people, athletes, have a resting low heart rate that's a resting low heart rate. Yeah. Because they're fit. Yeah. But we're talking about, I, I can understand the exercise and the fitness relating to the low heart. But we're talking about a mental exercise of meditation. Um, why... Why does it, why is a low heart rate beneficial? Does that mean the heart is working less strenuously? Yeah, it probably means you're under less stress, right? So if you're, and this would probably lean in more into heart rate variability, which is which is something yeah. slightly different to just pure heart rate. But um, yeah, and we kind of know this. I was so just another real life example. I was camping the other weekend. I went once a year I go camping with a group of friends, right? This guy's got an Apple Watch on, and he says, oh, it's got this function called ECG on there. It tells my heart. I said, okay, I've not seen that. Show me that. So he presses a button, and he looks at it, and his heart rate's higher than he, than he likes. So he says, oh, hang on, hang on. Let me do it again. I want to, you want to get a better result to show me. He says, let me do it again. And I watched him. This guy doesn't meditate. He doesn't practice mindfulness. But he presses the button again and just starts kind of regulating his breathing. I can see him literally being with his breath more. He's kind of just following his breath a little bit and his heart rate comes down and he's more, he's more happy with his ECG result. And I kind of, I didn't say anything to him there, but I kind of smiled as, as I drove home that weekend. And I thought, do you know what? Instinctively, we know that all this mindfulness stuff, even people that call it BS, which is me to start with, instinctively, we know that to get in a slightly calmer state, we've got to quiet our minds a little bit. We've got to calm our minds. We've got to calm our nervous system. We've got to shift from, sympathetic nervous state which is a stress tense got to get this done next quarter's got to be better how's the business doing straight oh, why aren't we doing about this and we're... to parasympathetic which is much more much more kind of rest and digest and if you can have ways during your day by the way and i'm not talking about just sitting and meditating for 10 minutes at the start of your day there are ways that you can bring mindfulness into your day whilst you're walking down New York and whilst you're on the subway, whilst you're waiting at a red stoplight, whilst you're drinking your coffee, whilst you're showering. You can do mini meditations if you want to call them those, where you bring so, the same effect of meditation into your every day. And when you do that, Zev, cumulative effect starts to kick in. Then your resting heart rate and something like that will probably start to come down a little bit because you're starting to calm your mind more frequently. You're starting to physi physi physiologically slow your body down and give it the signals that this everything's okay we've got this and your body listens to that and starts to adapt to that so uh, you know very often in life the i'm going to call this the the academic label or maybe the scientific label that we assign to certain things are also a turn off because it's a concept that oh if i don't know anything about it ah whatever right yeah it is do you think i think i understand what mindfulness mean yeah. right i think i understand i i'll probably get it wrong because you're going to correct me but to me mindfulness is awareness that's how i associate that's how i was able to kind of wrap my my 
my brain around this thing. It's an awareness, an awareness of whether it's your breathing or if I walk down, I'm in New York City and there's nonstop sirens here. I'm yeah. relocated here for a couple months. Uh, and you said I could walk down New York City with honking horns that are constant to ambulance and, and police cars with sirens going by and still achieve that mindfulness, right? Yeah, with practice. I wouldn't recommend you learn it in that state, but yeah. Okay, so, so what you're saying is you you practice the, the craft, then you can apply it yeah. in any situation right. you're in. Yeah. Okay, so um, I have another question. When I say, I mean, there, there, there were some schools of thought that used to tell us that if you repeat certain word over and over and over again, eventually it works, right? So I could have a really bad day. And this was actually part of a sales training that I took years ago. They said, anybody asks you, hey, how are things going? Great, great. Always say great. Always say great. Everything is great. How are things go? Oh, I'm super happy. Yeah. So that, that's part of the BS, right, mm -hmm. that, that we have exposed to in our lives that creates the skepticism mm -hmm. about something that clearly works, right, mm -hmm. as you, you're, you're a test case. It mm -hmm. works. Um, so for, by me just saying I'm happy doesn't cause anything, right? But what happens, what actually happens when you meditate? Because to me, like you, I'm a, I love neuroscience and human behavior. I was a psych major. By the way, my first experimental psychology uh, class that we took, and I'm, this is years ago, over 30 years ago in college, we did biofeedback experiments where we, I was hooked up and I, I was working on reducing the temperature in my index finger in my right hand. Okay. And, lo and increasing it on my left hands. And, and it works because you're connected to instruments. And so this is not voodoo. This actually works. We, we can control our minds and our behavior, but there is an association through the meditation, through firing up the region in the brain. And the feeling of happiness is basically release of certain hormones. It doesn't happen because you think about it, right? Yeah. There's a physiological... There's a physiological connection between the act of meditation to achieving that state. It's not spiritual. It's actually physical, isn't it? Yeah. So we're getting in quite deep here. And some of the, some of the first things I'd say, in fact, let's rewind. Can I rewind to your definition of, of mindfulness? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Go, go the definition it. of mindfulness was awareness. <laughs> That's kind of nice. I quite like that. Exactly. But if I was new to this, I would still not really know what you're talking about. Mindfulness, don't know what that is. Do I care? No, really. Awareness, what is that? I'm aware of, I don't know, I'm aware of my laptop here and headphones and a mouse and is that mine? Mm -hmm. I mean, who cares about that? Is that going to help me sleep tonight? No. Is that going to Is that going to bring my blood pressure down? No. What is this? It's still BS. Doesn't matter what word you put on there. So what I try and say to people is forget all the labels, right? Forget the greatest definition in the world. Doesn't matter what Google tells you is the sought after definition of mindfulness. I would flip it back on people, and this is what I'd say to them. We can do this right now. Think about one moment in your life, recent or past memory, you could be five years old, doesn't matter, where you either just felt deeply peaceful. Maybe maybe it's just for a second. Maybe you had a vacation this summer and you're lying on a beach wherever you are, if that's your thing. And for two seconds the weight of the world lifted and Oh, you feel it. It was enough to notice it, right? Maybe it was very brief, and then you thought, oh, God, I'm going to fly back tomorrow, and I've got work. So maybe, but just bring to mind one moment where you felt deeply peaceful, and maybe you're still, or maybe you were deeply peaceful and doing something very active. This could, this would be described as flow state in athletics mm -hmm. and in sports. Um, so very active, the body's very active, but, the you know, it, it's, you feel very peaceful. Or maybe you just noticed a beautiful sunrise, sun, sun, sunset somewhere. Maybe you'd spend time with your dog in the morning and her tail wagged and your eyes met and for a couple of seconds it felt good. So to any of these moments, and I would argue that for most people, these are some of the most beautiful moments of their life that they're bringing to mind here. And the question I always ask is, you've got to zoom in all the way in here to find out what's happening here, right? We've got to unpack this so you can understand it. 
you need to understand this experience. And if you zoom all the way in, the question I ask is during that moment where you felt that intense aliveness, you noticed that joy, you noticed that beauty, you really felt that deep peace, how much thinking were you doing? And most people mm -hmm. say, none. Because so you don't have to. Right. Because, because, you, because you're in that, because you're in that, I don't know if, I don't want to call this happy. Happy is just a generic, stupid word. Yeah. You're in that, it, it's almost like you, you're in your, it's yours to keep, it's yours to treasure. Yeah. N nothing penetrates it. it it's, it's mine. And yeah. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm holding my hands this way because I'm thinking of this, this light thing that, that, that's in here and I'm, I'm, I'm guarding it <laughs> because I'm enjoying yeah, it, right? And, from, and, 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 but, Go ahead. Instinctively, we kind of point here, don't we? When we talk about peace and feeling great, I'm just going to put a light on. Um, we, we kind of point inside, like this is where the peace is. This is where I feel great. It's kind of, people tend to point, they don't tend to point here. And that's really interesting, right? Because what I've just kind of pointed to with you is that when we interrupt this otherwise incessant stream of thinking, whether we fly to Barbados and have a few days on the beach and then the mind is still, ah, oh, feels good, whether we're going to shoot hoops with our friends or play baseball or whatever. And during that, we're so focused, we're so in the present moment that the mind stops. People find it, um, this is one of the reasons people love dangerous activities, dangerous sports, um, is because you have to be 100% present. You instinctively know that. Otherwise, the chance of you dying goes up massively, right? But all these beautiful moments have one thing in common. The mind is quiet. The mind is still. The incessant chatter has stopped. And that would be a nice definition of mindfulness for me. Because yes, you are aware. The awareness, the awareness, the word you used awareness there basically means that your attention has come out of thinking and into your senses, probably. So you're more you're inhabiting your body more with your senses, you're more aware of smell, of taste, of touch, of what you can hear, what you can see. And when those things happen and your mind starts to quiet down, we all know it feels good. We all instinctively know it feels good. We're all constantly trying to still our minds, whether people smoking cigarettes or weed or something else, whether they're drinking whiskey, whether they come home and reach in the fridge for a beer after work, open a bottle of wine. Why are we doing all these things? Why are we throwing ourselves into work so much that we can't even think about our problems anymore? Because we know that we need to have a distraction from our thinking mind. And most people go this way, they fall below thinking, they sedate themselves, they drink something, they smoke something, they try and distract themselves. With mindfulness, you go the opposite way, you transcend thought, if you want to use a big word, you just mm -hmm. rise above it. So the thinking can still happen, it's still there, but you've risen above it for a second. And you've not zoned out, you've not chilled out, you've not sedated yourself, you're more awake and alive and alert than you ever were, actually. And when those moments happen to us in our life, coincidentally or deliberately, and for most people, it's kind of coincidence. You know, it's when they go on the vacation. It's when they're holding their baby. It's when they're sitting with their dog. Whether they happen deliberately or accidentally doesn't really matter. They're all the same. Um, but when we notice them, they're beautiful. And that's a moment of mindfulness. And so I teach people that it's possible to have these moments no matter where you are, no matter what you're doing. So how did you, going back to IBM, um, look, my impression of, of IBM, super successful company, great, great workers. Um, I had an opportunity to intern them when I was in grad school and no, I would never work for them because they were, I mean, they were too stiff for me, for my, and, and I'm not politically correct. So I wouldn't last a, a week there. I think the IBM universe was blue, blue suits. And I think they called this sincere tie, right? I think that was a definition. Okay. Whatever the heck a sincere tie means. Yeah, but so how do you bring something like what we just discussed into a real, I'll apologize to IBM in advance, but a real like a, a, a conservative tight ass type of a company? <laughs> yeah, kind of kind of through the back door, kind of accidentally. So, you know, this, this is just a fact. This isn't uh, saying anything that people didn't know. The most senior of the leaders when I was when I was in IBM didn't see the value in mindfulness. Even though IBM had been sorry, even though Google had been doing this since two thousand eight, um, mm -hmm. the senior leaders in IBM at that time didn't see the value of it. So I had a really tough time 
trying to bring it in. And I didn't go to the most senior people and say, hey, hey, have you seen the signs? Have you seen the ROI of this stuff? Have you seen you know, how it can affect your bottom line, your absenteeism, and all the other great things it can do? Um, I just sent emails out to people saying, listen, I've been to Oxford University, because I've been to Oxford University by, by this time, right? And we'd I bought an eight-week program back into IBM. So this is a scientifically proven, evidence-based, eight-week mindfulness course specifically adapted for a workplace. Not a clinical one. It's not a, a public course. This is a mainstream, secular. It's the most secular thing you can ever do. Um, and I brought a program back into IBM. And I said to people, "Who wants to come on it? It's free. I'm doing it in my own time. If you want to be a, if you want to be a guinea pig, if you want to do a pilot, sign up here." And I had enough. I, I thought I'd get about five, six names. I got about sixty names within an hour. People would bite my hand off for it. And the feedback I got, because some pretty senior people came on it, not the most senior, I'm not talking senior vice presidents and CEO, the CEO, yeah. but some senior, some pretty senior people um, all over Europe came on it, actually. And, and when they, at the end of their eight weeks, when they started saying things like, this has been life-changing for me and my family, then the kind of rumor mill lit up and... You know, when people themselves directly experienced this, then the game changed. And that's that's the big mistake that most companies make when it comes to mindfulness. They think you can get somebody in on a Friday afternoon at four o'clock, um, you know, pay them, pay them whatever they pay them and say, oh, can you do that mindfulness talk? Because that's, that's the flavor of the month. I keep seeing this stuff in the press and online. And can you can you just make our stuff? You know, just tell them what mindfulness is. You know, nobody ever got fit by listening to a talk on fitness, did they? And, and you don't change them, you don't make anybody mindful by talking to them about mindfulness. This is the experience of this stuff, right? There's two types of knowing in this world. I can know something conceptually. I can I can study honey. I could tell you the molecular structure. I could tell you how it's formed. I could tell you everything about it. I could have a PhD in honey. If I've never tasted honey, I don't know what honey is. I can just tell you lots of facts about it. So when you shift people, when you take people from the conceptual understanding of what mindfulness is, what meditation is, to the direct experience of it here, and they feel it, ah, now I know what you're talking about, Steve. Forget the clever definitions. This is what helps me sleep better. Forget the clever definitions. This is what's bringing my blood pressure down. Forget the clever def definitions. This is what allows me to put my five-year plan down at dinner and be with my family. Then people go, okay, this is the most normal thing in the world, and I love it, and I'm going to practice it, because do you know what? It's just the greatest thing ever, along with all the along with all the other great things I do, right? Which are my nutrition and my sleep and my exercise and blah blah. Mm -hmm. blah. So, how how did I bring it into IBM? Um, by trialing it and it kind of catching light and it kind of went viral. You know, I had a wait list of five hundred people and and um, we ended up partnering with Oxford University and it did. The top of New York, we, there's a place in in New York, IBM called Almonk. And and the men and women there. I I know it well. I worked right okay. right there. Yeah. So our monk that they they validated that program, that eight week program, as the first and only corporate approved mindfulness program in IBM. Yeah, it, it, it's interesting. One of my best friends uh, it, it was an Israeli guy who worked for IBM in in Yorktown Heights, which is their brain center. This is where. They're a top scientist, a PhD in quantum mechanics. What I didn't understand what he was doing, yeah. but that's where he was. Yeah. But I remember he told me that, and that's what's interesting, that I've never been to that building, but he said in the building, the top floor was a designated, like it was a place where you could just walk around the building up at the top floor okay. to just to just think. Yeah. So you need to get out of your there. And and that's where you found these these brilliant geniuses doing their thinking, mm. just walking around at the top floor. So I guess the 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 other comment I have, Steve, is that that as human beings, we absolutely stuck at discipline, right? We we grab into something that has maybe an instant gratification, yeah. um, and if it requires extra work. Maybe we'll do it for a while, but then, ah, eh, whatever. So what I'm talking about is um, there's a trade-off, right? You can meditate, build it into practice, which I think you will tell me you need to practice it and do it. 
Otherwise, it dies off, right? You know, I don't meditate. If I meditate right now for two minutes, it's not going to last me four days. I need to do this as a practice. Mm. But then it's much easier for me to, I mean, if you walk down the streets of Manhattan, as I've been doing for the past two weeks and continue to do for a couple of months, um, the, the smell of vaping and and the pot smoking, which is now through vaping and through all these other things, it's, it's, it's literally all over the place. So it's, what I'm saying is, as human beings, we're looking for instant gratification. Yeah. Well, you can drink, you can do CBD, and you can vape and do whatever other things yeah. that give you instant stuff. We're very good at running away from challenges, yeah. right? It's the fright or flight, you know, amygdala brain that's still active. Yeah. Um, is, so I could take your eight-week course... But then on the last day of the course, what are you going to tell me to make sure I don't fall off the wagon, so to speak? Yeah, it's a really good question. All right, so how do we, how do we set people up for success here? Because yeah. habits are very hard to form, they're even harder to keep. And so the reason the course is eight weeks long, you can kind of do it in six weeks, but I prefer to teach you in eight. The reason it's eight weeks long is because eight weeks is probably scientifically the point at which... Um, you can start to measure the effects on the human body of this practice, right? So the course can't be two, three weeks long because you may see nothing particularly of interest in those first few weeks. But what we do on the course is before week eight, I'd already be asking you to look back. So ever since we finished six, week six, actually, I'd be asking you to start to reflect back on all of the different things we've practiced because I'm going to show you a bunch of different doorways into, a same, into the same rooms there. I'm going to show you a load of different ways of quieting your mind, calming your, your nervous system down. Mm -hmm. I'm going to show you a lot of different ways of achieving the same thing because this isn't a one-size-fits-all and you can't dictate. As soon as you start dictating, somebody needs to do something, then they're, they're going to kind of rebel and stop doing it. So people need to form their own plan. And the way you do that is you outline all of the different ways of doing this. You let them practice all of them, and then you start to see which ones are really working for them. And then they start to form their own plan. So they said, you know what? I love the body scan in week two. It really helps me sleep. I'm going to keep doing that. I'm going to commit. There are lots of ways you can help people during those eight weeks and after. Um, one of the ways, one of the things we do in the course is I ask people to write a letter to their future self. Very powerful thing mm -hmm. to do if you've never done it. Something I turned my yeah. nose up at. I thought it was another thing that was going to be BS. Very powerful exercise thing to do. But what I've actually started adding in is um, is kind of post-course support. So one of my other offerings, just really quickly, is, is, is called a mindfulness sprint. And in the UK, when we went into lockdown, we had this PE teacher, this, gro this great physical instructor, and he came online every day and he just did 15 minutes of, of workout. And he, it's called Wake Up With Joe, guys called Joe Wicks. Millions of people who didn't really care about exercise and Zev weren't really fast. They thought it's, it's, only, it's only 15 minutes. I can do it in my lounge. It's super easy. I don't need to. They would dial in, they'd connect in, they'd move their body. And if people felt better, he got millions, he raised a load of money for charity, got loads of people moving that wouldn't have moved. And I thought, can I take that principle? It worked so well in lockdown. Can I take that and can I apply it to our mind? Can I make a mindfulness version of this? And I offer this now in businesses. It's a two week sprint. Anyone can get together, you can dial in, whether you're in New York, Portsmouth, doesn't matter. We come together, we spend 15 minutes doing a short practice together. I'll send you an email straight after with some tips and a way you can also carry on practicing this in your day, not by doing something different, but by doing something differently. And it's a fun way of just getting a group of people together. You start to build the habit. You start to see how it's panning out in your life. So, yeah, the most successful companies that really transform their – or a large percentage of their staff's well-being through mindfulness, which is a massive statement to say, they offer them support during the course and after because you have to you have to make this something that people do for long enough that they start to see the benefit from. And and so and again, I will tell you from experience. I think we spoke about it last time you and I chatted. Um, our friend Zineb, who we both admire and adore, has this saying, I'm not for everyone. Yeah. Right? And so what you just said about, about companies that have this initiative, the difference maker is the person at the top. 
Look, in my universe, I work with family businesses, small businesses, not enterprises. Yeah. And the, the person, if the owner of the company truly, genuinely, genuinely cares about his employees, if the person is humble enough to recognize that they cannot achieve any level of success or make all the millions that they've been making without the people that work for them, mm -hmm. and if they have that awareness, recognition, then they will do everything they can for their employees. Yeah. Not as an alternative to, oh, I'm not giving you a bonus because I hired Steve Ware and, you know, he's costing a lot of money. That's stupidity, right? They do it because they care. Mm -hmm. And if they care, it's not just about buying lunch once a week or having a Christmas party. It's recognizing that, yeah, you know, most of us, when we were employed, we spend more time in the office than we spend with our family yeah. on a daily basis. So if you care, then do something for them. Yeah. Uh, and, and like, like you said, and like you, look, you, you bring me a hundred business owners and sight unseen, I would tell you that probably 85 to 90% of them fall into the greedy, I'm paying you, just do what you, the ones that don't care. It, it's, it's unfortunately a small percentage of people that will do the things that you're doing for their employees because they care. It's just that, yes, there's an impact on productivity, correct, right? I mean, uh, I'm, I'm a quality manager's guy, right? We, we always said efficiency equals profit. Yeah. Okay, well, if you're calm at work and you're productive, Yes, the company will do better, but that, that's not what they should be looking at. It's not like, how do I make more money, but how do I get to a point where my employees are mentally, physically well? Yeah, but we've got to be realistic, haven't we, Zev? And if, and if 85 to 90% of people, um, let's, let's not mince our words, but they don't particularly give a crap about their staff, if they're just the right. resource, then... And how do we get in the back door? How do we sneak in and still give the staff something that's going to be really helpful and supportive for them? I mean, you can show them the ROI that Deloitte say that a proactive mental well-being intervention like mindfulness has an ROI of over five hundred percent. So this is this is kind of bottom line stuff. You can there's, there's plenty of big companies out there, Aetna, US healthcare provider, Google, all these. You know, there's a lot of evidence out there that um, supports great mindfulness programs having a huge ROI, not just paying you back in how much you cost, but you know, far in excess of that. And there's also been some great research done by a lady called Dr. Amishi Jean, University of Miami. So she went on a mission, this is interesting, she went on a mission, right? Forget mindfulness meditation. She went on a mission to find what she wanted to call it, and her book is called Peak Mind, P-E-A-K Mind, right? And she wanted to know, how do people train their brain in a way that they are reliable and have access to the parts of memory and brain that they need to when they're under intense pressure? Now, she's talking huge pressure. She's talking about first responders. She's talking about military. She's talking about situations in which the decision these people make um, could literally mean the death of, of one or more other people around them, right? So no higher stakes. And she found... She went and spoke to all these experts and she found that the brain training, even though I don't like that term, that's the term they use in the book, the brain training that will give you the most reliable access to your mind under intense pressure is mindfulness training. That's so what so let's take that to the boardroom. This means that the guys that have got more self-awareness, more emotional intelligence, are more mindful, more present, more aware, they're gonna make the best decisions in high stakes situations here. So when they're making multi-million, billion-dollar decisions in boardrooms, this can really help them there. So, I mean, it really transcends every part of an organization. And whether I sell it to a company, I, I won't work with companies who, you know, are using mindfulness as a sticking plaster over a gaping wound, right? They're treating their employees like crap, and they say, Steve, can you come in and save the day? We'll pay to do an eight-week mindfulness course. No, if you're treating your staff really badly, I'm not there to pick up the pieces for you. But I will have a conversation with a skeptical leader who says, maybe my staff are going to like this. Maybe there's plenty of employees are going to like this. Show me what the bottom line is, right? Because, yeah, I kind of care about them. And, of course, I want them to be happier than not. But unless they start keeling over, I'm not really going to do anything, right? 
So mm-hmm. there's there's a conversation. You've got to be realistic. I've got to meet people where they are in the business world. If I'm teaching this in business, it's not going to be full of caring people that are putting their arm around their staff and hugging them and saying, how can I support you and what can I give you? And I really care about you as a person. No, you're a figure on a spreadsheet, especially if you're in a massive corporate. You're a figure on a spreadsheet. Are you well? Are you off sick? What's going on? How much are you costing us? How much money are you making us? Do we need to make you redundant? Faceless. To the SVP of HR who's never met you, never going to meet you, probably don't care about you. So to bridge mm-hmm. that gap, you know, there's, there's plenty of things you can you can show people, real hard figures around the ROI of this stuff. Is is mindfulness like muscle muscle memory? Or if you do it enough, you can, you don't have to think, you, you can think about it, obviously, but you go into it. Yeah. And it, and it doesn't become a chore. Yeah, I think it becomes much more natural. And I give you, again, I give you a real life example because they're best. So I, when I started practicing, I worked on IBM in Portsmouth for 28 years, right? It's quite a nice site here. So it's it's on some reclaimed land. So there's kind of a, a, a kind of a stream, kind of lake around it. And I can remember driving in there. So bear in mind, I've been working there over 20 years, right? So I can remember... I haven't, after been meditating for a little while, I remember driving in, getting out of my car. I did the same walk. I'd walk across the bridge into the building up the stairs. And then across the bridge, I thought, where are these birds come from? I can hear beautiful birds singing. Gosh, so it's a spring morning. And I can hear this beautiful chirping, just, oh man, such a light, peaceful, effortless, beautiful sound. Just, oh man, where are these birds come from? And as I walked across the bridge, I took a look down into the water and there's these fish coming up to the surface and kind of swimming around and doing their thing. And I thought, where'd these fish come from? Now, the answer to both those questions is they didn't come from anywhere. They've always been there. But my mind has been so busy. I've been so on automatic pilot. I've been so consumed by thinking. As soon as I got in that car park, I'm in work mode. What do I need to do? Have I done that? Did I send that email? Did I send that project plan through? What client do I need to meet with today? Have I done that? 100,000 miles an hour, right? Ping, 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 ping. When my mind was a little bit more settled, more calm, I was just a bit more present in my surroundings naturally. Wow, the world the world goes from black and white to color again. It goes from standard definition to high definition. You're like, wow, yeah, this stuff exists. Wow, this is beautiful. Wow, this is such a nice way to walk into the office. And that can really, uh, as, as you're thinking about it, somebody who's who's been divorced, uh, it, it could really does have an impact on relationships because you're talking about appreciating more natural surroundings, but a lot of times relationships fall apart because we weren't aware of our partner. Yeah. We were just sucked into daily routines and whatever, but the, the awareness, the mindfulness of the person you spend your time with, your life with, Sometimes we take it for granted, like you said, right? I heard birds chirping. Oh, of course there's birds. Okay, I'm going to keep going. No, stop. Yeah. Look at the bird, right? It's it's very interesting. So, Steve, for um, I'm not going to call myself a skeptic because I'm I know enough about this and I know enough people, and, and to me, you were kind of like the authority in this, who say without hesitation this stuff works. Yeah. So I'm not a skeptic. Yeah. What would want someone like me who hasn't done it, who dabbled with it a few times because the Apple Watch told me, <laughs> okay, time to stop and do some breathing. And I just said, nah, whatever, right? Uh, and oh, by the way, I got rid of my okay. Apple Watch. This, this is Whittings, which keeps all my vital body stuff here but it's a regular watch and it doesn't interrupt it doesn't interrupt me with all the nonsense um so tell me from as we end the podcast what how do i get into this as somebody who is who recognizes it wants to do it never really done it how do you how do i ease into it and prove to myself that it works do i go on your site and i think you have tips or what do we do yeah, so I I don't tend I don't tend to teach the general public aside from senior leaders. So I do have a like an executive program where I work with people one on one for six months. That's a very bespoke kind of high level offering. Uh, mm-hmm. Otherwise, I do teach in corporates and groups. If you're an individual who just wants to learn this, I would I would start either with an app or a book. Honestly, 
And mm -hmm. I would I would only start as if if you feel something in here, if there's a, if, even if it's a tiny thing. I don't want people to start because you know their partner says, "Zev, you should do mindfulness." You know, you, you you you're too snappy with me. You're doing this, you're doing that. Or someone says, "Hey, I'm meditating, Zev. You got to do it. It's unbelievable. I can't tell you. Look at the science. Are you convinced yet? Start doing it. Right? That stuff never works ever. I spent too much time when I first discovered this trying to tell the friends I thought who who needed it to try it, trying to tell the family members who I thought would benefit massively. It doesn't work. So I never, ever preach to people. I never say to people, you've got to start doing this. Why aren't you doing it? But if there's some, if something resonates in you, if there's a part of you that's curious that says, do you know what? Maybe. Maybe. Let's find out. Then I'd probably start with a great book or a great app and just start slowly and gently. My top tips would be you've got to be kind to yourself. You've got to be kind to yourself. You've got to expect nothing for a little while. You've just got to practice it and allow the outcomes to unfold at their own pace. You've got to try not to get anywhere when you're doing this. It's so counterintuitive, some of this, which is why it's great to find a good teacher if you do really get into it, because there's certain little obstacles they'll get you around. But I would say, you know, to start with, just look at the greatest moments in your life and, and unpack them and see what's really going on there. And if there's an element of you being more present and more awake and alert and, and truly there, then mindfulness can almost certainly help with that. It can help you notice these moments more, enjoy a deeper version of these moments, and just invite them in whenever you want to invite them in. So whether you start with a book, if you were to ask me for a book recommendation, I still say, and I've been saying this probably for 10 years as a book, is called uh, Finding Peace in a Frantic World. It's a very secular book. It's a very easy to read book. And the, the app I started with, well, I've got no affiliation to them at all, but the app I started with was Headspace. And they've got some, mm, some yeah. nice stuff on there. But there's Calm, there's Insight Timer, there's Waking Up, there's loads, right? Um, I'd probably say start very slowly and gently. Um, do it for a period, for as long as you can. Commit to at least a month and try to start to invite this stuff into your day. Don't expect too much, but have a little peek back at a month and say, well, what's, what's, what's realistic here? You know, what's happened? Can I, can I feel anything? It may be something silly. I stopped biting my nails. I used to bite my nails down. I used to chew my nails. It's an anxious thing. I used to bite them all the time. I was never a smoker, but I chewed my nails. I just stopped doing it. So you may notice tiny thing. When people come on my courses and they say, oh, this is tiny thing. I say, it's not a tiny thing. That's massive. That is massive. If you stop biting your nails, that's a huge sign, right? That's a sign that you've started to calm your mind, that your anxiety is slightly lower. And this is going to be the start of something great because our life is made up of tiny moments. And if you can affect those, you're affecting your entire life. Well, I think that would be a, that is a beautiful way to, to end the podcast. Um, Steve Ware, W-A-R-E, is on LinkedIn. Uh, you can connect with him there. I will include all the jewels of wisdom you've given me in the show notes. Thanks, sir. Um, and um, encourage anyone, including myself, and I'll commit to you that I'm going to uh, – I'm a book guy, so I'll get that book. Um, I don't have an Apple Watch, but I have the iPhone. And uh, I give this a shot because I hear more and more people. Uh, I'm, I'm the kind of person that show me – and I'll believe in yeah. it, right? I don't buy into things that because somebody with a PhD said it and Absolutely. everybody in the universe is watching their show, I couldn't care less, Absolutely. right? But if if it were, and look, I've got, I have snippets of examples in my life that I know this works. Okay. Uh, and I mentioned to you that I play pickleball, the competitive level, and I'm coaching people how to play. And as somebody that, I started coaching a couple of days ago and, and she's very energetic and, and really becoming a great player. And I said to her literally today, and I said, listen, one of the things that's going to improve your game is calm yourself. Yeah. Find a point, find a point where you relax because it, it's a very fast moving game. Like I mentioned to you, it's like, you know, doubles ping pong on a half a tennis court and it's very yeah. fast. 
So it's easy to get sucked into the energy yeah, of, yeah. of it's back and forth. And I said, but I found particularly when I do tournaments is when I'm forcefully calm myself through breathing, mm. uh, I play much better. Mm. I just, I, it, it works. So I said to her, you, you, I see you love the game and you, and the energy in it. You've got the skill set to really be a better player. But if you actually find that, that balance of just relax yourself when you serve and relax yourself when you're receiving, then you focus on, you focus on the game, not the points, whether you win, you lose, you made a mistake, because that's what happens to a lot of people. Well, so let's bring that back, um, Seth, because a great point to finish on. What are you actually doing yeah. when you do that? What she's doing there is she's stopping thinking. Yeah, so when I was playing tennis and, and took lessons, the pro, because in tennis, and just like in this game, when the serve is kind of a good serve is very important. Yeah. Obviously, you guys have Wimbledon, yeah. right? If you're a good server, you'll have an edge in the game. But it's also riddled with anxiety when mm -hmm. you go to the motion of serving. I always worried about, is it going to go in? Is it going to go in the right way? Am I going to hit the net? And remember, he said to me, and I, by the way, I use it to this day. He said, when you serve, you know how to do the motion. Just keep repeating in your head. Only the ball, only the ball, only the ball. Which is a, a, a nice technique of not allowing your brains to engage in other yeah. things thinking about what's going to happen, but just repeating. It's like only the ball, only the ball. I still do it now. Mm. It's only the ball, only the ball. It works. So it's a different twist on yeah. It's not meditation, but it's a way to quiet your mind as you Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So, all right, Steve, thank you thank so you. much. This has been awesome. Thank you, Zach. You've been very patient with me for all my changes, yeah. but uh, I'm going to make sure I press the right button. Right. Hold that one second. <laughs> okay. Hey, good luck in your uh, next round. Thank you. Hang on.